All right, let's get started. So, welcome everyone. This is from jQuery to Flux to Elm. I'm Richard Feldman. So we're gonna be talking about these three different technologies from an architecture perspective today. A lot of different ways you can compare them. Today we're just focusing on architecture. And we're specifically gonna look at four different things. Validating inputs, testing logic, rendering updates, and reusing interfaces. And we're gonna see how these compare across the four, or across the three different architectures. And to do this, we're gonna make a band name generator. This is our, our sample app that we're gonna make. Here's how it's gonna work. So the end user will select two genres of music, so hip hop, country, heavy metal, things like that, and then we're gonna generate a band name for them. So let's say they select uh, country and heavy metal, for example, you might get a band name like Tractor Demon, which, which might have a hit single like Save a Horse, Ride the Lightning. And so, okay, let's, let's take a look at what the UI for this might look like. This might be our DOM. So we'd have a little select two genres across the top, have two different drop downs for selecting the genres. And then when the user selects these, we're gonna validate that they didn't select the same genre for both. Because if you select country and country, that's not funny, that's just a country band. Okay, so let's start by taking a look at how these three different architectural patterns deal with validating inputs. So, a change event fired, the user Clicked one of the dropdowns, they selected one of the genres, we got a change event. Question is, what do we store? Architecturally speaking, what do we store? Do we store anything? So jQuery says app state goes in the DOM. That's where it belongs. So to the question of what are we gonna store, the answer is store nothing. We'll query the DOM later if we need to. The user selected something in that dropdown, fine. If we need to know at some future date what the value of that dropdown is, we'll just go ask the DOM at that time. This will save us some time up front. Granted. Okay, what does Flux say? Flux says app state goes in stores. That's where we're gonna keep our app state. So when we get this change event, we're gonna inspect it, and we're gonna update a store with the value of the dropdown when that event came in. Elm, the Elm architecture, says app state goes in the model. So when we get this event in, it's very similarly to Flux, we inspect it, and we're gonna put it in the model. So Elm architecture model, Flux stores, a lot of similarities there. Okay, so so far we've got this table of how each of these three different architectural patterns deal with just that one change event coming in. jQuery says do nothing, we'll, we'll look it up later. Flux says put it in the store, Elm says put it in the model. Okay, so now let's say we've got these selections, these genre selections, and we want to determine the validity. Did the user select two of the same genre or are they different? So we'll write a little function to check this called isValid, and it's gonna take selected genres as an argument and return whether or not it was valid. Okay, so in Flux, pretty straightforward. We're gonna look at the store, say store.genres. We, we recorded these earlier when we uh, got the event, and we're just gonna pass that stored value into isValid, and that's gonna give us our answer. Elm architecture, same deal, except model instead of store. Model.genres, pass that to isValid, we got our answer. Now in jQuery, we can't quite do this because we didn't write it down in one place. We actually have to go do a query to get that state out of the DOM, because that's where our app state lives, it lives in the DOM. So we have to write a function called something like getGenres, it's gonna run a query for all of the classes with the genre class, and map over the results to get back the same answer that we already had stored in Flux and Elm and then we can call is valid with the result of that. So already, we've sort of seen jQuery's chickens come home to roost, where we have this uh, event that we were able to ignore previously, but now we have to go do an extra query, whereas Flux and Elm architecture can just call is valid, passing the value they've already got stored. jQuery doesn't have that stored value, so it has to start off with a query before it can call is valid. Okay, what about testing? So we want test coverage. This is an app, we're, we're making something for the long term. We wanna test it. Question is, what does that take? What is required if we want to test this stuff that we've written? So in the case of Elm architecture, if we wanna test this business logic thing we've written, this validation rule, it's really simple. We call is valid, passing whatever selected genres we want, and just check the result, that's it. Does it make sense? If they were the same, did it give us the right answer? If they were different, did it give us the right answer? Flux, same deal. Call is valid, check the result, done. jQuery, we still need to do that. We still need to call is valid and check the result, but that doesn't give us complete test coverage. 
Because remember, in Flux and Elm, when we're getting out the value of the selected genres, it's just access. We're just store.genres, model.genres. There's nothing to test there. But in jQuery, we actually have something that still needs testing, this query function that gets it out of the DOM. So actually just accessing our application state now requires testing. Think about what happens if this class changes. What if it's no longer a genre class? We refactor it, maybe because we're intending to change our styles, not even intending to mess with our business logic, and yet we've broken this. So because there's potential for regression here, we actually have an additional test burden here. We have to set up a DOM and test that query to make sure that it's still working properly and doesn't have regressions. So now we see that whereas jQuery started off with an advantage, where it was doing less work and getting the same result, now it's actually doing more work to get to the same point. So because it wasn't storing anything in that event, not only do we have to do more work to validate, we also have to do more work to test. OK, what about rendering updates? So we've now determined if something is valid, but we want to show that to the end user. We want to render these validation errors for them. The question is, who alters the DOM? I mean, someone has to. We have to show this to the end user. That requires altering the DOM. Who's going to do that? jQuery, as usual, has the most direct answer. We're going to query the DOM to find the particular nodes that we want to mutate, and then we're going to mutate them ourselves, be as direct as possible. Now, with Flux, we have to start talking about React. Because in theory, you can use Flux with whatever rendering system you want, but we have to pick one. And we're going to pick React because that's the one it was designed to be used with. So React has this component hierarchy. And components describe the desired DOM. We don't mutate the DOM directly. We just say, here is how we want the DOM to look. This is the idea of a virtual DOM. And then React takes care of actually transitioning the DOM from where it is now to the way that we said we wanted it to look in our component hierarchy. Elm has something very similar, except it's just a view function. It's not a component, it's just a function. So this is a lot like React stateless components. The idea is you give it a model, and then it returns a representation of the desired DOM. That's it. So we can see some interesting characteristics here as well. The uh, render process for jQuery is querying and mutating. With React and Flux, we just result in a component, because we've already got the state we needed to start with. And in Elm, we just call a view function. Now what happens if I found a bug? So if you have a bug, that means that the screen is not showing what you expected, which naturally begs the question, how did the DOM end up in this state? This is not what I expected. How did it end up this way? And when you're trying to answer this question of how did the DOM end up here, you need to sort of step back and trace how things got this way. And at this point, reproducibility is incredibly important. You want to be able to go back to your previous application states and look at how they changed over time. You want to be able to say, OK, at this point, we had this particular application state, and the screen looked like this. Is that right? OK, good. Step forward, and then keep doing that until you find the spot where things went wrong. So being able to take your entire application state and generate a DOM from it that you can look at and figure out if that was the broken state or not is incredibly helpful for debugging. And if you have a single source of truth, like we do with Flux and like we do with the Elm architecture, this is easy to do. Remember with jQuery, as we're going along, we're making these mutations. There's no way to record that state along the way. It's just getting thrown out. We're just mutating and that's it. But since we have the single source of truth, we can just record it as we go along and then replay it to figure out where things went wrong. And finally, we come to reusing interfaces. And this is where things get really interesting. So let's say we have a new requirement. We want to add the ability to select subgenres. So not just metal, but maybe thrash metal, speed metal, symphonic metal, things like that. So we're going to have an accordion instead of a dropdown. And since this is not something that's just built into the browser, we're going to make our own custom accordion. It's going to look sweet. But of course, since we're going to make this accordion widget, this is not something that should only exist in this one part of the application. We want it to be reusable. We want lots of accordions, potentially use them at any point. So the user clicks to expand one of these accordions, expand a section in the accordion. The question is, what state changes? What's different now? So in jQuery, as is always the case, the answer is we change the DOM. We're going to toggle an attribute of some sort. So this might be a class. Maybe you click and it changes the class to show you that now we have a, a different class on that that 
describes the accordion being expanded, or maybe it's a data attribute. Either way, jQuery says app state lives in the DOM, so that's where we're going to put it. What about Flux? So, so far, every time we've gone from jQuery to Flux, it's been pretty consistent. So jQuery likes to go to the DOM, and Flux likes to put app state in the store. But the thing is, since we introduced that rendering piece, change of store is not the end of the story. Because we're on React in Flux now, and React has its own way of doing this. So React is really big on drop-in components, these reusable components that you can just drop into the component hierarchy and they just work. They've got their own self-contained mutable state that they can manage themselves outside the rest of the application. And for this to just work, you have to be able to write an accordion component like this that manages and mutates its own state. You just pass it the contents you want, you drop it in anywhere in your program, and it just works. So who wins when we can do either of these approaches? I mean, either we're going to put it in the store, or we're going to put it in the component state. Which do we choose? I mean, we, we can do either. The choice is up to us, but we have to pick one. So this sort of begs the question, well, if we only ever change store state in Flux, I mean, why would React have that feature? I mean, all components would be stateless. This would not be a new feature in React 0.14. This would just be the way things were always done. So we can kind of infer from the way the libraries are designed that sidestepping Flux is the way to go. It's what the libraries suggest by the feature set that they offer. And this is what tends to happen. OK. So we're going to mutate component state. That's the answer. That's how we're going to make this reusable accordion. What does that mean for reproducibility? Well, the answer is querying is back in. This used to be something we only did in jQuery, is that we would query the state on the fly. But now we have to. We no longer have all of our app state in stores. If we want to figure out what the state of our program is because we're stepping back and we're trying to find a, where a bug happened and we want to recreate the DOM at each of those stages, at any given point in time, we can't just look at the stores like we could before. Now we need to go ask each of our components that are using this local mutable state feature and say, what is your state right now? What is your state? So we can write it down and then serialize it again later. In other words, we have to go around and gather up all these scattered pieces of state in order to assemble the whole picture when we're trying to reproduce things. So what does Elm architecture do about this? Well, Elm architecture, the rule is if we need it to render the UI, it goes in the model. And that's it. That's the end of the story. So yeah, we need the accordion expansion state in order to render the UI so it goes in the model. And if you're coming from a React background, you might say, eh, that, that, that sounds weird. That's, that's, that's unconventional. Yeah, it is, but it's got some great features. For example, reproducibility still works, and it scales. No matter how big your app gets, you've always got reproducibility. This is how Elm can have a time-traveling debugger that just works. Because at any given point in time, if you're trying to figure out what your app state is, and you want to get a working DOM out of that, you've got it all in one place, in the model. It's not scattered around, potentially, through multiple different components. It's always in the model. The other feature that this gets you is simplicity. You don't need this whole toolbox, this whole tool shed full of tools. You can just have a nice, simple toolbox. Compare how these things ended up looking. If you look at that right column, you can see everything in the Elm side is just data or functions. In the jQuery side, we're doing all this querying, we're interacting with the DOM, all these different things going on. In the React and Flux side, we're using some stores, which are more complicated than functions. We're using components, which are more complicated than functions. They both got some data and methods going on. And sometimes we're using stores and components. So this does beg the question, can we get reproducibility in React and Flux? Can we, can we get that? I mean, we used to have it until we started doing reusable stuff. Can we just have that? The answer is, yeah, totally, as long as you use 100% stateless components including third-party components. So you can either have total reproducibility, this great debugging benefit, this great testing benefit, or you can have components that you can just drop in and they just work. You can't have both. You have to pick one. And if you want total reproducibility, you have to be very consistent about this. You have to be very disciplined. You have to make sure that not only are you not using this 
feature that exists, but also that none of the third-party components you're using are using them either. So this is one of the benefits of Elm the language, uh, as opposed to just Elm the architecture, is there's no discipline needed for this. So not only is it designed this way, but it's all guaranteed at build time. If you try to violate this, or you try to do a side effect in a view, the compiler will tell you about it. It won't let you make that mistake. It's pretty nice. OK, so what have we learned in the course of building our app? First, that jQuery defers effort, which makes it the fastest to get something going on the screen. And full disclosure, I love jQuery for prototyping. It's great. I mean, it's, as long as you're going to throw away the prototype and not have to maintain it later, it's great for that. It is the least maintainable, though. React and Flux, it's a simpler system than jQuery. There's less going on. Your state is more consolidated, which makes it more maintainable. But when you start getting into reusable components, it does tend to get more complex. The state starts to get scattered around more, and you lose some of the benefits that you had at the outset. The Elm architecture is the simplest system. Might not be where you're used to, but it will give you the most maintainable results. If you'd like to get started with Elm, uh, I work at a company called No Red Inc. We are so hiring, by the way. Uh, we use Elm extensively in production, and we've got a blog post that called Building a Live Validated Sign-Up Form in Elm. Basically, it takes you through, if all you know is JavaScript, it'll get you from zero to having built something in Elm that works using all of the stuff we just talked about start to finish. And uh, as of this week, I can announce that there will be in the future another resource you can use to get started with Elm, which is this book, Elm in Action, that I'm writing uh, for Manning Publications. Uh, if you'd like to keep tabs on that, I'll be tweeting about it. Thanks very much.